know what really makes us mad is wasting money on CDs with only one or two good songs. Yeah. Tell them about punk. What's up, posers? Welcome to Funk's Auto Pod. I'm your co-host, Justin Hensley. I'm your other co-host, Dylan Hensley. And this is the show where we assign our guests a year, and they choose one punk, hardcore, emo, or punk-adjacent album from that year for us to talk about. Today, we are talking to Brendan Stevens of the band Overo, as well as formerly of the band Perfect Future and his solo project, It Only Ends Once. Overo just put out their newest full-length album called Waiting for the End to Begin. And hands down, one of the best records of the year. Strong, best of 2022 contender, for sure. What are we talking about today? We are talking about the year 2000. And the record is Tragedy's self-titled debut, Tragedy. Yeah, this is a really fun conversation. I was very happy to talk to Brendan. We have a little bit of a history with him, and we'll talk about that at the beginning of the episode, so check that out there if you want to you can head over to our patreon and for one dollar you get access to all of our bonus audio this week we are doing a chart dive on the year 2000 we've done a chart dive recently but we haven't covered 2000 before that usually means we didn't have time to prep anything yep (laughs) this week did not allow us to do anything else yeah so uh yeah chart dive of the year 2000 over on patreon.com slash punk pod For $1, you get access to all of the bonus audio. Literally all of it. As many hours as you want. Sign up, unsubscribe, and you can still download everything for a month. So do that if you want. But if you're interested in a little bit more, for $10, you can choose what album we talk about. So basically, you get free reign to decide what album we're going to devote an entire episode to. So that's on the Patreon, at Punk Lotto Pod. You know, okay, I was thinking of this, and I will... I'll talk this through with you right now as we're recording this intro. I'm thinking about doing a drawing for the Patreon where everyone who has signed up for the $1 tier will be entered in a drawing to get a free $10 episode where you get to pick the record. What do you think about that, Dylan? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Why not? This goes up June 1st. That way you get the maximum entire month to sign up. So yeah, we'll do that for the entire month of June. Everyone who signs up for the $1 tier, you'll be entered in a drawing for the $10 tier where you get that episode selected for free. You just only have to be in the month of June. You don't even have to keep it after June. That that $10 that $10 episode, the, the one you select, will be in the main feed. So, yeah, we'll run that through June, and then we'll pick a winner in July. And and if you're already a patron at the $1 tier, you're automatically entered. Like, you've, you've, you've been in it. So, there we go. That seems like a fun idea. And then you can follow us on all the social medias, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, at PunkLottoPod, PunkLottoPod, gmail.com, voicemail, 202-688-PUNK, and the substack, PunkLottoPod.substack.com. I think that's everything, and uh, enjoy the show.
We are joined here today by Brendan Stevens of the band Overo. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks. So I wanted to bring this up, and I didn't want to say it in the email originally because I kind of wanted to see, just throw this out here. So we have actually met before. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so A long time ago. Yeah, I, I found mm-hmm. it too. Way back June 23rd, 2010. Okay. At the Heartbeat Gallery in Mooresville, North Carolina. Whoa. You <laughs> I still think about those sh- those shows and I was they were not well attended, so that is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, for the listeners, uh it was your previous band Perfect Future and mm-hmm. uh, supposed to be reaching away yes. on that tour, but they had unfortunately <laughs> had to drop. Can, oh, can I tell my favorite Heartbeat Gallery story? Oh yeah? Go ahead. Yeah, it, it was basically just the it, I can't remember the name the names of the people that that were there, but the, the the lady and husband who owned it. I remember like we stayed with them after that show, oh, wow. and we were talking about bands and stuff. And then the the guy was like, "Hey, well, I'm actually joining the Marine Corps pretty soon." And I I was all in band mode, and I thought the Marine Corps was like a hardcore band. <laughs> and so I was like, "Yeah, I've never heard of them." And he just like looked at me like I was the stupidest person that ever existed because I'd never heard of the Marine Corps. <laughs> Is that like an like an ISIS post metal kind of band? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I think about that all the time. Oh God, <laughs> that's hilarious. So the other band playing that show, there was a band called Oddzar, who was a Charlotte band mm-hmm. who we actually became friends with, and mm-hmm. we played. We yeah. were we were in the uh, I guess we were the first band maybe yeah, Cinder we and Smoke. Oh yeah. I mean I, I'm sure you don't remember this just because <laughs> I don't remember the songs but like I I, I do remember those shows and the, like it was such a cool space but yeah, yeah like I said it wasn't particularly well attended um, but I'm used to like kind of those weird I mean I I grew up in a very small town so mm. like I'm for me like a great space with like ten people there it's like <laughs> that's that's normal. <laughs> That was such an interesting space because it was an art gallery, but it was in a garage. Mm-hmm. And it was basically in a big complex that was basically a bunch of garages for NASCAR teams. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that was what everything yeah. else was. Because <laughs> I lived like I lived like 20 minutes away from there. And my parents lived like a little bit further west from there. But and it was it was. It always struck me as such a weird place, and we'd been to multiple shows there, and they were always really pretty poorly attended because it was so out of the way mm-hmm. and such a weird location. Like, they really tried, and, and it was really cool that they did that, that they were like, we're going to have an art gallery, we're going to have a punk venue, let's find a cheap space to do it. But- hey, it, and I, like I said, like, I mean, for me, I, I, I consider those successful shows i still look fondly on that but it's just like certainly like yeah it was a it was off the beaten path for sure (laughs) yeah because i actually went and found let's see i'm trying to think of what i think it was like a a message board posting that someone either you someone in either probably you or either someone in reaching away posted like Mm -hmm. the tour dates it was and Mm -hmm. it was like really long tour like i was shocked at how long that went (laughs) Yeah, Perfect Future, like, you know, that's like the band when you're, I I mean, I was either a senior in college or straight out of college, and like, uh, I was like, yeah, what's, you know, what could be better than being on the road for like 60 days, Um, (laughs) and I don't know if I can do that anymore. (laughs) Two weeks is, I'm like, that's like the perfect amount for me now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it it showed, it was like you played Chapel Hill, then... it had Charlotte listed, but that's where the Mooresville show came in. Mm-hmm. And then the other one was like Asheville. And I was like, wow, three NC shows in a row. And I'm sure they were all roughly the same amount of people showed up. <laughs> uh, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, uh, <laughs> yeah, Perfect Future was like, I mean, that was, that band opened up like a lot of doors for me because, like I said, I was very rural Appalachian punk, like in, in Western Maryland, but like, uh, you know, it, much more closer to West Virginia. I was like, I drive 15 minutes in three directions and I was in West Virginia. And so like getting linked up within a scene and then just like, just pure grit and stuff like, yeah, it opened up a lot of doors, even though we were never the biggest band on like a record label or anything like that. But I think some of that might've, 
so I've only recently, like I moved to Houston five years ago and that was the first time I was like in a band in a city and it was just like, oh, people come to us, like come to us and we can just like a cool show will happen and we can just hop on. I'm like, oh, this makes so much more sense than like <laughs> begging bands to come to Frostburg, Maryland. <laughs> yeah, that was that was our whole like. Uh, hey, we have a, there's a coffee shop that'll let us book shows. Hey, do you want to come play a show here in, in our, in our town? And just like, we have a, like two local bands that'll play every single show. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I I still kind of like, I, I romanticize those scenes a lot. Like, you know, whenever just like being on the road and passing some through some town I've never seen before, but has, you know, you're just driving on the highway. I'm like, there's gotta be some punks there doing something and it's probably cool or at least you know, every show is going to have the same 30 people because it's everyone in town who likes <laughs> yeah. this type of music. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of cool as well. <laughs> I I wonder if you've probably seen this more than we have, but like, I wonder if it feels like back then, you know, this is what, 12 years ago at this point. Yeah. There seemed to be more kind of local scenes, like for the really small mm. towns. And I feel like a lot of that's died down. I don't know if it's just maybe like, where we live, where I live currently, it's just it's dead as far as a local mm. scene goes. But I don't know. It's interesting because I don't I don't know how active like I don't know. Basically, my idea, is, my statement is like, uh, are high schoolers still really starting bands like they used to? I don't know. My sense. So so John from Overo is probably the person for this because he's much more well connected. He's just a fan of music in general, um, whereas I'm just like only interested in like punk and metal, uh, <laughs> but. I mean, it, there was during that like mid two thousands. I mean, rock guitar based music was mainstream, mm-hmm. um, and that doesn't seem to be the case so much anymore. And it's it, it to, and to some extent, I think some of it might be just the fact that the ease to create music and be an artist uh, with you could do it all on an iPad or on your phone. Um, now, if you're not in a like a traditional type of band, which has like a whole monetary issue of like okay well we need to find a drummer and drums are expensive and they take up a lot of space it just seems like if you wanted to be a musician and create music it'd be very easy to create loops to create beats to create like you know just like a bedroom metal band or something like that rather than the kind of stuff that we grew up on and i think yeah yeah i think it kind of goes hand in hand with like the ease of act it's easier to be a musician now without spending five hundred dollars on an amp coupled with the sort of like well rock and roll like like i mean there were a period of time where like a metal musician would be dating a pop star that where i mean it didn't get much bigger than like i mean there were some really 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 big cool punk bands and uh it doesn't seem like guitar based music is mainstream anymore um, but like, I, I, I was always kind of more drawn to like the weirder side of punk anyway. So, um, it doesn't really impact me personally so much. <laughs> just more of like the, the, it's, it's, it's like a cultural sort of observation that maybe is like totally flawed. <laughs> well, that actually kind of brings to mind too, like in my head, like, you know how many artists, like, especially if you look like the indie scene specifically or like the mm-hmm. DIY stuff a good chunk of the, like the big names in there are like one person projects that like yeah. they it was a bedroom recording originally before they did anything else before they even mm-hmm. formed like a band to mm-hmm. go on tour with so that's probably real that's probably is what it is cuz now cuz when we were starting up it was more of like the only way to write songs and pl- record stuff is to have f- 3 4 5 people in a room playing together mm-hmm. and then you're like you're already playing together so then you just want to play more play out play live shows you want people to see it mm-hmm. so yeah i guess it is a little it makes it it makes it hard to break through still because you know you don't have that live element but mm-hmm. the recording part and getting it out there is a little easier yeah and the the whole thing with like the ease of access that the internet ha- has created to like get songs out onto spotify and stuff it becomes a little bit more like who can who can get through um and create a splash with a, a like maybe even just one song that uh 
rather than the like uh the grind it all out on just playing a million shows doesn't matter how poorly attended <laughs> it yeah. is uh so yeah i, I don't know it, it, it things seem to be changing uh, a good bit and I, I i i'm trying not to be uh an old man about it and <laughs> say that it's worse <laughs> it's <Yeah>. just different <laughs> I mean, I would say a benefit to it is you don't like you, that grinding out isn't really there. So maybe the mm. longevity is more stable, mm. you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, b- perhaps. And I, I mean, a- another change I've been seeing um, is just that, uh, I mean, there are a lot of uh, shows that like, you know, v- Vera will play a show with a band that might be mostly like 10 years younger than us, you know, people in their 20s and stuff. Um and we're still like in that mindset of like an LP should be ten dollars, um, <laughs> and like these younger people like they're doing tours that seem much more sustainable because they're they're charging basically what like you know a converge or like a bigger band like you go, you go to a you know a band on Death Wish and they'll be selling a a hoodie for forty five fifty bucks and like in my mind I'm like we're a DIY band everything should be like razor thin margins that like (laughs) you're you're hoping you can uh, i don't know just to like just to break even but there's like you know i I think it's like probably good for the long uh, like these people on these like these younger people on diy tours that like yeah maybe maybe a ten dollar seven inch uh you know you sell half as many but you still make as much as if you're doing the five dollar seven inch um i don't know except for you know, you can sell more of them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's still I, it's still very hard to tell because everyone's everyone's still kind of like cagey about accounting. They don't want to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no one wants to be that band that gets yelled at on the internet for like, oh, we toured in a you know some like super expensive like <laughs> what was that sprinter one? sprinter van or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually landlords, and you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's not I mean I don't think that's going to happen with the average you know DIY band but everyone yeah everyone's still like mm, should we keep that to ourselves yeah you know, what what do things actually cost I mean I, I like I mean I I'm it's something that I, I've thought about recently with just like you know Fugazi with the five dollar cover and like you know that was like in the 90s and I still am like five dollar cover is perfect and <laughs> uh it's like you know what's the, would that be like fifteen dollars now like I don't know, <laughs> know by now but it's certainly not five dollars which is what I I feel is the appropriate amount but definitely is not <laughs> given uh all of this and also I've never I'm not in Fugazi that like can you know pack a <laughs> uh, a huge like room and make money on five dollars <laughs> yeah like or or even the equi- or the thing that we used to see or like even do ourselves where it's just like just pay what you can you know like yep. that kind of show <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> perfect future had a whole lot of like you know uh, it's like wow this room is full how much do we make like three dollars and like loose cigarettes and it's like <laughs> none of us smoke like <laughs> <laughs> well we didn't set a hard price before people could come in <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I mean, that's still, I feel like that still is a valid thing to do. I think that creating music, especially when you're coming at music from like a punk perspective, and if you're anyone who has been informed by Fugazi at all, like there's like, there's something that's countercultural and anti-capitalist and has value in saying like, we're going to let people in, like we're going to make this accessible to people regardless Mm -hmm. of their income or, you know, where they are in life and what they can afford and i think that's i think that's still something that's very commendable oh no i i'm i i'm still here for it and that's like mm-hmm. how I, I how i pretty much all of my stuff you know is that way but like i feel like i'm if we're talking like cultural shifts in punk i feel like you're seeing younger people and they're like like bands that are like people in their 20s will have the like they're not doing the free band camp downloads yeah. you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I mean, that's, you know, I I feel like the it's it swings, <laughs> swings the other way too, right? Like, it's totally like, it's it's your art and you can decide what to do with it and you can set the price for it. And that's, mm-hmm. you know, 
Mm-hmm. You did the work, so you decide what it's worth. I mean, that I feel like that's also still pretty anti-capitalist. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's very pro-labor. Like, I know what yeah. I'm worth. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> just you know, just like me at work, I'm like, that's not my job. Exactly. <laughs> Am I getting an extra tip out for that, or what's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> or you can work for a corporate job like me and it's uh you don't really get to decide what you do and don't do so. yeah <laughs> uh you're expected to do this okay mm-hmm. <laughs> well let's let's talk about overo a little bit uh we, we spent a long time just talking about <laughs> diy music in general which is which is yeah. fun i'm always down for that conversation but so the band just released a new full-length album waiting for the end to begin and the record is incredible and it's probably my favorite overo record i've heard so far thank you mm-hmm. how's the feedback been for it really incredible um it, it certainly feels like one of the records that i've uh done that has just had the most positive things to say from you know whether it's reviewers or just people like um reaching out like old friends that like or like just really really responding well to it um and it, you know it feels feels great like i'm kind of used to throwing things out into the void and then just like having that like serotonin blip for like a couple of days and then it's long gone um this has been a little bit more sustained than that (laughs) yeah there's because there's what there's the uh everybody always says it's like the album cycle now is everything leading up to the actual album coming out Mm -hmm. yeah and and we like this is also something that's been a long time coming we 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 had the usual amounts of um like delays from the pressing plant and then uh, issues getting uh the covers and stuff so i mean the songs i mean most of it was written like straight up right during the beginning like uh, i mean it's a very much a pandemic written record mm-hmm. we were like the only people that we were our bubble was just the four of us um and so we wrote those songs and we recorded them probably in 2021 um and then you know just gain every gain through all those manufacturing delays and stuff like yeah it's been a long time coming <laughs> yeah i was curious if it was if it was one of those records too they like it was done last year but well we got to wait for it to come out but that's... Um, it, we and we recorded uh those songs at the same time we did the split lp uh another year in hell same same session and then uh basically after we've written so many Overo records that's when we did that like tobiano release which was just like hey if so overo i'm gonna i'm gonna mess this up i think but i think overo is a brown horse with white spots and then tobiano is a white horse with brown spots we're like let's do a uh uh like an ep that has no distortion and is very much uh you know, like i play i mostly play piano on that um and that was all written and recorded while this waiting for the end to begin was being pressed and it came out before <laughs> I, I was gonna ask about that release because I, I remember i listened to that when it came out too and i was like wow this is a very different direction so what what inspired that uh, so it's solely that um you know we were just talking about well what what do we do especially if this is going to take uh over a year to press and get these songs out into the world i mean i was a little bit like i you know, I, so I I basically came to the band with a few different things, and I was like, here here are the options. We continue to write Overo albums, and then we get like a second LP in the tank, <laughs> yeah. or something. We do something crazy like a covers album for, or just like record a bunch of one off stuff for splits with that haven't even been talked about. Um, we just take some time off and uh, or do some sort of weird side project thing even though it would just be us and that was kind of the one we decided to go with um but yeah uh mercy in particular her philosophy is is she always wants to play whatever the most recent material is and so she worried that if we kept writing a bunch of overo stuff that like by the time the album came out it's like well who even want we don't even want to play these songs anymore (laughs) (laughs) so Tobiano was just a yes, totally like okay. Let's do something totally different, and uh, you know, it, it it was probably just being a bit too clever, being like okay, it'll be a different band, but the same members, and we're gonna instead of being a band that is 
like distorted and screamy there'll be there'll be no screaming there'll be no distortion like it'll be slow uh yeah <laughs> you know, i've seen a lot of bands have done the you mentioned the like you recorded an album a year ago and you're mm-hmm. like well we've already got another one ready uh, like I've, mm-hmm. we've talked to a few people who are like yeah we've got another one done already and we're ready mm-hmm. ready to go for it and it's just like <laughs> That that is you're right. It is gonna be weird whenever like you start to kind of like yeah, shows are kind of back now. But like when people mm-hmm. are really going and playing out, it's like well now I have all these other new songs and then like nobody's seen these other ones live now. But mm-hmm. I'm tired of them, you know. <laughs> yeah, I have to go relearn the LP that we finished two years ago to be able to play the songs. <laughs> yeah, the ones that people want to hear now because yeah. they're all fresh. <laughs> Especially yeah. if you're, if especially if your band has a lot of growth. I mean, can you imagine, like, you know, being like, oh, well, we're more of a shoegaze band now, but we're still <laughs> playing our hardcore stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah, and then like, I guess the idea too of just being like, well, we could take a break. Well, that a lot of times when bands take breaks, that's the end of the band because they are just mm-hmm. like life gets in the way. You start doing other things, and you forget to come back to it. And mm-hmm. so it's a, it's a unique way of uh, keeping it keeping active yet not like burning up a bunch of potential material yeah and for me so i'm i'm a writer and i don't i don't see people besides my like wife like i so i just wanted a reason to leave the house like (laughs) (laughs) so i'm like we have to keep playing that's the thing because it's the one scheduled event i have where i see other people (laughs) and two like throw in throw in like you put out the Tobiano, you've got the new Overo record, like there's a new Football Etc. EP they just came out too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like everybody's staying busy. You you actually have another yeah. project too. Uh, yeah. That's your solo project and it, mm-hmm. uh, that is called It Only Ends Once. Yeah, that's my Black Gaze one man uh, project. Um, and yeah, yeah, I have, a, I have an EP in the tank that I'm like just waiting to release but I'm just like trying to not clog. <laughs> I'm like, if football, etc., Tobiano, we did, Overo did that split LP not too long ago. Yeah. I think it was this, this year. And then we just did this LP. I'm like, I'll wait a little bit to release that. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it only ends once is, uh, is, it's really fun for me because it's, uh, it's a d- very different form of way of writing. And just like, I was, everything I've done, uh almost every album i've written has been very much in the like uh it it is very punk in my Mm -hmm. mind Mm -hmm. um and so this is the first like even when i'm like you know it's it's more indie or quiet it's like coming from like a punk lens um and this one's kind of taking more of the like atmospheric uh black gaze black metal type of stuff um which so this is something john told me uh john from overo he, he was just like he's like Black metal is just uh, screamo in the woods, and I'm like, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and I don't know. I think uh, uh, I've I've thought about that a lot, and just kind of like the difference between what like kind of a metal uh, approach where it's focused more on like virtuoso sort of. D- uh, approach uh to music where if if someone can play you know piano you should play piano like show off like show off all the uh, the elements of your artistic expression as possible whereas punk is more like you know piano that's not punk or (laughs) you know (laughs) or if if you have like synthesizers and stuff it'll be like gimmicky like uh, so i think this band's great um and and gets uh but like horse the band versus like neurosis like they both have like keyboard players but like (laughs) people think of horse the band as being like kind of hokey but neurosis is just like legendary um so i don't know uh, like it only ends once coming from a uh, with me trying to very much write even though like there's a lot of screamo in there there's a lot of hardcore and a lot of um and a lot of the the riffs i'm usually like playing like emo chords tremolo um but I see it as more of a metal type of project where I'm just like trying to, if if I want to include synthesizers or I want to include anything, I, I I go for it rather than just try to be like, okay, strip down what's what's only necessary. I, I feel like metal 
Even though metal also, like punk and metal also, they do that thing where they have their like strict set of rules about what is and what isn't, Mm -hmm. you know, especially if you're getting like into the more scene type stuff. Yeah. But I also feel like sometimes metal is more embracing of the experimental stuff. Like Mm -hmm. I feel Neurosis being like a legendary band, but they're also quite Mm -hmm. experimental, especially compared to like what else was coming out at the time. And like, to me, a metal band throwing in keys or synths now, it's like, cool it's just like yeah. another thing whereas yeah. you're right with punk it's kind of like well is that your gimmick like is are you that kind of band you know mm-hmm. yeah yeah are, yeah are you you're oh you're a synth band yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just uh you know just a, a different way of i mean i think one of the like the blessings of the type of being very self-taught in my uh songwriting is that like I'm I'm not like good at hearing something and like uh, being able to recreate it. So like I feel as if a, a lot of my music, no matter, I've written in different genres, but I feel like it always kind of sounds like a Brendan band. I'm not one of those people who can just be like I'm gonna be exactly. This is going to be a clone of you know Neurosis or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you know I, I, to some extent it's like uh, I. I, I don't know. I, I just find find that to be interesting because I have some friends who are like who are so much who are more talented and better at, at musicians than me, and they're very. It's very easy for them to be like, "Oh, I want to write a Ben Folds type of song," and then it just sounds like Ben Folds, and it's like, "Wow, that's incredible." <laughs> if I tried to do that, it would just probably sound kind of sad and sound like me playing piano in general, rather than <laughs> me doing another person's thing. <laughs> Yeah, you could always be like, "Yeah, this was my this is my uh, this is my uh, Thin Lizzy inspired song," and they're just like, "Yeah, mm, just sounds just like uh, your other stuff." <laughs> yeah, it, it'll it'll it'd be that, but it would just have more harmonized guitars. Right. Um, <laughs> the only difference. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, you know, I'd say that's a good trait to have, though, too, because then you're not you're less likely to like for people to hear something you do and go, "Ah, that's just a knockoff." So, mm-hmm. that's that's a positive trait to have <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, the Overa record is available from quite a few different labels uh, in the United States. Middleman Records. Uh, let's see what else. I wrote down the others. Uh, Strictly no capital letters in the UK. Pundonor in Spain and mm-hmm. Zilp Zalp in Denmark. I think that's all the labels. Germany, but uh, yeah, because oh, D-E. D- yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the abbreviation in, in yeah, yeah. German is yeah. <laughs> D- yeah, I I got ESP for Spain, but I missed that. Yeah. One. <laughs> No, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, you can get the rest of the... V- I'm, we can get everything through the Overo Bandcamp, right? Yeah, yeah. we ha- Everything that's available that we have. But, uh, yeah, those are the... We've been working with those labels in general. So, uh, if people are, um, you know, in the UK, Strictly No Capital Letters has pretty much everything. And Pundinor has m- all of our stuff in Spain. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, everybody can get a hold of that stuff there. So... Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, let's get into the rest of the show then. So, the basic premise of the show is we assign our guests a year and they choose one punk, hardcore, emo, or punk adjacent album from that year for us to talk about. And before we get to the album you selected, we gave you the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) why don't we go through some of the records you you were considering selecting for the episode? Sick. Okay, so I have uh, five that were real top contenders. Um, so um, probably the one that is like, it, it, maybe this should be the one that I actually picked because it's the album that actually got me into punk would be AFI's The Art of Drowning. Hmm. Um, before that, and I, like, I'm not joking, I only listened to Weird Al. Like, <laughs> I was not interested in any other music. <laughs> Um, and then my brother like got the art of drowning and it was like the first thing that like, you know, dry, I mean, I, I was in middle school at the time, but like w- he had gotten his driver's license and that was like what we would listen to was he was dropping me off. And, it, and I was like, okay, this is cool. And through AFI, I got into all the other punk bands that like my brother liked and then, you know, quickly then started getting r- real weird and liking all sorts of other stuff. But, um, so Art of Drowning is like a record I listen to still, um, usually just like in the 
like when it starts like getting close to Halloween, I feel a little spooky. Um, <laughs> but like you know, it, it it's a it's a like AFI is a band and the Art of Drowning is a record I'll always love. But it's like not a hundred percent like where my heart is at all, at all the times. So <laughs> yeah. Do you uh, is there a point where you stop? Like, is there a point in AFI's discography where you fell off, or are you one of the people who like stuck with them all, like all the way through? Um, I fell off a couple of times, and then I get back on. Yeah. Like, uh, I didn't I wasn't so into December Underground, but right. then like I felt like it was too poppy, and then like I I, I don't know. Uh, uh, eventually, I started being like, ooh, it's like this is a fun poppy record. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then they got gothy again, and then they got like kind of hard rock. So. They, I like AFI for 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 what they are, not like who I wish they would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's the traits of AFI that are there. They'll always be there, you know. Like mm-hmm. Davy's always going to sound like Davy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> even if like the production is now super slick and the type of thing you could just hear on the radio, but mm-hmm. yet still don't, which is funny too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I- so I also thought about uh, God's Bleed You Back Emperor's uh, Lift Your Skinny Fist, and that actually might be, I mean, that, again, that should also be a record I strongly consider. Um, I mean, for practical reasons, and this is something I, 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 may, I even mentioned to y'all in an email, was like, well, what do you, do you just excerpt, you know, two minutes of a 20-minute long song, and it's just <laughs> one riff? Uh, I don't think, would, I hope someday someone, it does this record justice because it's like you know a masterpiece uh but at the same time i i, I felt like I'm like this would be a, a difficult record to really um go into and an excerpt and yeah mm-hmm. just yeah we um we did there's a the silver mount zion record that we did with the members of the band closer and mm. um so there's a little commonality that like some screamo emo bands like talking yeah. about uh, <laughs> these uh, Canadian French French Canadian right? They're from Montreal. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Post rock bands. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I that was the hard part of like putting that episode together. I was like, how much song do I play? Because if I only do my <laughs> usual like minute thirty, then mm-hmm. it's like, well, that's the intro. Uh, yep. <laughs> It, 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 like that you might not have even gotten to the music yet right. it might just be like just <laughs> you know build up yeah um i mean a couple of screamo records that like uh were also on that list of, of uh, albums i wanted to do either uh orchids dance tonight revolution tomorrow um or page 99 document five both just both those records really really hold up um you know they, they still sound um you know they still sound fresh to me, um, and uh, I, yeah, I listen to those records quite a bit. Um, even though uh, I, I, I tend to listen to Orchid's self-title, uh, uh, like the Gatefold LP, and uh, later Page Ninety Nine a little bit more, but I still back those records real hard. Do- yeah, yeah, Document Number Five is one of my. That's five and seven are my favorite Page Ninety Nine records. I think. Mm. Those are. There's something so special about them. <laughs> it, it, it's before they started having like, well, I, I, I'm like, I, th- I think the Document Five was like they still only had two guitarists and they only had one bassist, so it's like still, <laughs> yeah, they hadn't exploded with having so many members yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the yeah, where it's like there's because I got to see them at, when they did those like handful of reunion shows. Mm-hmm. And and I saw them in Richmond, and of course, being the hometown, they were like, "Yep, everybody's here." And it was it was like twelve <laughs> people on the stage or something like that. It was nuts. That's that's what you, that's what you you go for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the my friend always tells the story about how like he saw like page ninety nine at some like house show in like Greensboro or something during this mm-hmm. time period, and he said that uh, yeah, they blew the breakers like three times. Because there was just so much equipment in the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ed Hockley did that to me whenever they played my my basement. It was <laughs> at, at one point I was like, "Do you think you could play through like like half of your amps?" And like I don't know if it's worth it at that point. <laughs> uh, Ed, Ed Hockley, we one, actually had John and is it, is it Garrett? Garrett, yeah, Garrett. Garrett. Yeah. We had them on the show round when yeah. the the Calyx record was out. So. Yeah. 
great people. Um, I have one more record, um, and uh, which would be Weaker Than's Left and Leaving. Oh, um, yeah. I, I really... So the reason I didn't choose that one was mostly just because, like, the Weaker Than's is a band that, like, you know, I've been listening to for ages, and I... I know a lot of lyrics, but like, uh, it's just like one of those bands that like, I, I like I put on by, I, I never, I'm like, Oh, it's John K. Sampson. But like, I don't know a lot about them. Hmm. I never saw them. They're just a band that I really enjoy and put on when the time's right. Um, but I'm like, I don't know if I could, if I could nerd out over it as much as a lot of people. <laughs> the weaker Thans yeah. are a, a band that I feel like it could be hard Depending on who you're talking to, I guess. But it could be hard to talk about a Weaker Than's record without immediately kind of like jumping into the deep end of like <laughs> the the extremely personal significance of like mm-hmm. of those records or this or specific mm-hmm. songs. And it's like this that might be inaccessible to the average listener who's like, well, I've never heard a Weaker Than's record. So like mm-hmm. tell me. And then I'm just like. And he says on this one lyric, and that just means so much like, to me. And like, it's like, eh, all right. That's it's like I I burned that song onto a CDR I gave to this girl I had a crush on. Like, yeah. <laughs> it is funny that the weaker thans like they have that like the people who love that band. It's just like they love that band, and there is like a deep personal connection to them. And it is. There is no way to like really like talk about them without being like, this is their significance to me. But also mm-hmm. that also feels very weaker than at the same time. Like that's <laughs> yeah. how those lyrics are, really, you know. Yeah. Deeply personal, hyper specific. Uh mm-hmm. and then just, you know, John K. Samson himself as a person is just this in- he's an amazing individual just to like read and hear about just because it's like Oh well, yeah. He wrote a song for his library, and you know, he'll he'll only play a show if you send him a postcard. It's like he's just it's mm-hmm. such a unique individual, but yeah. <laughs> so I'm definitely not the person, but I, I you know, I I mean, I I really took this assignment seriously. Yeah, I I I was I was like only listening to music from the 2000 from the year 2000 <laughs> for like two weeks, um, and I was like. Which ones got me like really pumped, and that that record was definitely one of them. Dylan, why don't you uh, give us a quick uh, cliff notes? What else was two thousand uh, in music for punks? Two thousand is really interesting. Um, uh, I mean, the the records that have been mentioned are are a really good overview, but it's also like we have like hives, we have mm-hmm. um, late Green Day. Um, relationship of command by at the drive-in. That's probably one of the one of the biggest records of the year for sure. Um, in terms of like cultural impact and like long-term popularity. Um, we've got Slater Kinney. We've got late period Discord stuff from Barraquette. Mm-hmm. Kind of Discord entering its like full-on weirdo um, <laughs> phase, but also like M records, you know. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> starting starting to build up into that like uh the there's a lamb of god record too um so like getting into that mid 2000s like height of uh alternative music um punk and the uh, punk and goth and emo and and metalcore mm-hmm. stuff um 2000 is is really the i think the point where it starts to gain steam i had yeah. to look up i was like did razorblade romance come out in 2000 that's like uh that's one that my wife and I still like troll each other with like that him <laughs> record. <laughs> Man, do you remember where when him was everywhere? Yeah, yeah. Like, that I had friends who got the heartogram. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's so weird because it's like it's so like of the moment because like mm-hmm. it feels like what year did it like you just There's- never see anything like that again. Oh yeah, there's like a hard drop off. It's like 2007. <laughs> all him hardogram t-shirts disappeared. Yeah, <laughs> it just like evaporated. Like no one talked about him ever again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but for a short period, if you walked into literally every uh, hot topic on the planet, yeah, there was. You have to be in your mid 30s to understand. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's like definitely like one of those 90 kids only get it. Like, it's right? Like, no, you. No one else understands him the way we do. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Only millennials will understand. Yeah. <laughs> There's this girl that you have a kind of a crush on and she loves him and you're like him oh mm-hmm. <laughs> can or we there's just... some or there's some uh, like you have the friend who just way to him to ban margera and he's gonna like yeah. put like you know he's gonna slap your your face at a sleepover because of because he loves him like uh... <laughs> also it's funny him and cky like both of those bands <laughs> were so attached to him <laughs> yeah they're like opposite ends of the spectrum, too. <laughs> oh, man. Is this all going to make it into the show? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Him talk for sure. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, let's uh, let's get into the record you actually did select for us to talk about today. So we gave you 2000 and you selected Tragedy by Tragedy. Condition is flying out! on the band is is Mm -hmm. how i usually put them so tragedy were originally from memphis tennessee but then later moved to portland oregon they formed in the year 1999 this is the band's first album it was self-released on their own record label tragedy records and you could get it in germany from scold releases and true hack true in poland i don't know how uh polish people use their j's in (laughs) in their words but um (laughs) It was recorded six days in six days at Polymath Studios in May of 2000. The person on the record is Billy Davis on bass and vocals, Paul Burdett on drums, Yannick Lauren, Lorraine on guitar, and Todd Burdett on guitar and vocals. And the record was recorded by Dan Rathburn, who also recorded Gauze, His Hero is Gone, From Ashes Rise, Yafet Kodo, Iron Lung, and Ceremony. Quite a reputation there. Mm-hmm. It is worth mentioning that Billy played in From Ash's Rise, and Todd, Paul, and Yannick all played in His Hero is Gone. And various combinations of these members would also play in a lot of other Tennessee area bands. Um, these are guys who went back a long time with each other. And uh, it's interesting that From Ash's Rise were also a Tennessee band, and he transplanted to Portland separate from this band, I think, is part of how that story went. I don't know. It's, it's hard to find details about <laughs> them as people but um we'll get into the more about that later but yeah i love that mythology of uh, like because yeah i mean i mean this all happened in like 99 or something but just Mm -hmm. the fact that like a bunch of friends from this kind of specific memphis scene all just moved to portland i don't know did someone get a job? Did someone find a partner? <laughs> Did they just all like find some great vegan food like on a tour once and just like <laughs> I don't I don't know. I I, I love that they're and I, I kind of don't want to know. I I think one of the cool things about tragedy is like is the fact that they're they always were like mysterious without like necessarily trying to be mysterious to be cool. It's just like they didn't want to do interviews, so they didn't do interviews. They like. They had done stuff with His Heroes Gone, like on other record labels, like, well, we could just do this ourselves, and it worked. They there's just like the one press photo, which is just the photo from the back of the LP, and that's like the one picture you can find of them where they're like posed, and it's just them hanging out. Um, yeah, I it, I like that they're a band that like it, that there's that element of like anonymity mm-hmm. <laughs> that I don't think you really find too much anymore unless someone's like going out of their way to make that like a part of the brand. But like tragedy doesn't feel like that's like a part of the brand. It just seems like they didn't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It felt like they didn't want to put the effort into being like, well, like they didn't want a website. There's no website. They didn't want, mm-hmm. they didn't want a MySpace Cause that was an important part of the early days of tragedy. And mm-hmm. yeah, they were just like, ah, we don't want to do any of that shit. 
let's just mm-hmm. let's just play shows and write records. Love it. <laughs> Especially going back to like what we were talking about way back when, like the 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 cultural shift of punk. Like this is very different time, and I, I and like this is like um you know you know my, like MySpace w- was like a huge deal, but like they could they could get by on just doing shows, just touring, just putting out records. Um, which I think it, it certainly helps that they were in His Heroes Gone, who had their own reputation and everything. But uh, yeah, I just think that that's uh, like unrelated to the music i think that's a pretty special thing about tragedy that's certainly worth mentioning yeah so the first thing i usually like to ask is uh what made you choose this album for us to talk about oh it's just great <laughs> like um i mean so tragedy i think is interesting because like like i was saying they you know they're coming from his hero is gone uh primarily and from ashes rise but like they kind of arrive onto the scene fully formed as a band they don't like the first release is this is a full length. It's not a seven inch or something, which especially at that period of time, like bands within the like crusty, like hardcore scene, much more like you would do like two splits, an EP and then two more splits and then finally an LP. Um, and they just kind of arrive fully formed. And it's just, it's, it's a little different than he's Heroes gone, which has that like, um, which I think sounds like they his heroes gone seem more focused, you know, sh- shorter songs having, you know, but like uh, tragedy seemed more focused on like a melodic element and also just being like we're gonna have uh, lots of acoustic guitar intros and we're gonna have like dark sounding pianos and you know samples and stuff on it. Uh, yeah, just like from beginning to end, like this sounds like a band that's been together for like years and years and this would be their magnum opus and it's just the first thing they put out <laughs> yeah i was that here his hero is gone it was funny like i didn't realize that so i in my head i, I actually did kind of have these bands kind of lumped together like i had his heroes mm-hmm. gone tragedy and from ashes rise all like mentally like grouped together and like to the point where i was like i'm not a huge crust person so like my mm-hmm. knowledge was always just like are those the same bands? Like in my brain, like I'm never sure which is which, you know? Yeah. And it actually now makes 100% sense now. I'm like, oh, because it literally is the same people Yeah. <laughs> in those three bands. <laughs> and then you throw in the likes of like, so like Gauze, I always threw in. I'm like, okay, I know Gauze. They're the Japanese mm-hmm. one. Like that's the main yeah. difference. <laughs> but even then, it's like having the same guy like record all of those bands too. Mm. It's just like, well, yeah, that makes this, it makes the sound not uniform, but like have a, a consistency across all the bands. Which That's even, something I, I was thinking about was just like how, uh, I mean, again, it's a first record, but like these records productions wise, like just sound still so thick. They sound so heavy, so fast. Like, I don't know. I feel like uh, with a lot of the music I listened to, if I was going to say like, well, what are the best sounding records? Like, um, I feel like even a, like I would, I would start looking for something newer, but like if I was in a band, if I was in one of those countless tragedy clone bands, I would just be like, just just do exactly, try to make it sound as much like this because it just sounds perfect to me. Um, just it, like like the perfect amount of rawness and heaviness, but also it, it it's clean enough that it doesn't just sound like a wash or like it was poorly mixed. It, like clearly a lot of um, some people the mixing was done with a really good ear as well. Yeah. Uh, Dylan, usually I throw this your way. What, uh, what are your uh, thoughts or feelings on the band tragedy before you listen to the record for this show? Um, I knew what they sounded like for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew they were a band that I have enjoyed hearing in the past, but they weren't someone that I spent really significant amount of time with. Um, I did not know anything about them as people, mm-hmm. which makes sense because they, just didn't talk to anyone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, they were like the the exact template for the mysterious guy, uh, hardcore band. But I definitely thought they were European for a really long time. Hmm. I did not think that they were uh, from U.S. Uh, hmm. I definitely did not think that they had members of His Hero Is Gone. Um, 
or from any bands that I would have known. I thought that they were just like one of those European bands that always existed. <laughs> um, this record sounds like it's a Euro crust band that's always existed. Like, I mean, just talking about full, being, you know, a band that arrives fully formed, like I put it on and I'm like, yeah, that's like, that's a band. <laughs> that's a band that's been doing this for a while, which if it's all, you know, which makes a lot of sense when you consider it, it's like all of these people who have this rapport with each other have been playing music with each other for a really long time. Like it makes sense that they, they really didn't lose any, any stride in changing locations and, you know, changing band names essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, com- complete misconceptions, like no, no real information <laughs> on them prior to doing this episode. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, huh? Oh, weird. Oh, oh, there's three members of His Hero is Gone. Yeah. Who I also did not know was from Tennessee. I'm like, oh, His Hero is Gone. They're like from New York, right? Or like they're a Canadian <laughs> man, right? I'm just like imme- like making that connection to like who they influenced. You know, like, oh, they're a huge influence on Curse. So like they must have come from the same scene or something. <laughs> nope, not at all. I think I think it's very funny. Like I... I don't listen to tragedy, and I go, "Yeah, that's a bunch of Southern guys, like, yeah, <laughs> bunch of Tennessee guys from Memphis and Murfreesboro." I think was where one of the other bands they were in was like tagged as. Mm. <laughs> no, I don't get that at all. Yeah, <laughs> but in a way, it does make sense because if you've ever been to Asheville or Johnson City, there is a very active crust punk scene in those cities. So, mm-hmm. Southern cities, yes, but crust finds a way. I guess is really what we're trying to say. <laughs> Always does. <laughs> and I mean, I guess there's, you know, the crust is crust everywhere. I mean, it's the same mentality everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I mean, yeah, you could be like a German crust. You're going to ride trains too. I don't know. <laughs> you just maybe don't have to like actually jump onto moving trains. You can just take the train. <laughs> one of my favorite things like a whole band moves to an entirely new city especially on like the opposite side of the country too is really funny mm-hmm. and it reminds me too if there was like a north carolina band called zagoda who were like an anarchist sort of punk band punk screamo mm-hmm. band and the entire band moved to sweden like from Whoa. like greensboro <laughs> north carolina to sweden which was just like wild they were like a they were like a crime think band yeah i'm I'm just wondering how they got like the the immigration. Like, right. you, do you, you get someone to sponsor you? That do they all get different sponsors? Did... <laughs> I can definitely see it being like one person got in, and then he's just like, "Hey, just come live with me, and you'll be you just yeah. be an illegal immigrant." <laughs> we'll just be squatters <laughs> in yeah. Sweden mm-hmm. now. <laughs> um, yeah, my my track that was my tragedy track too. Like, I just didn't know anything about them individually. Um, mm-hmm. So, like it. I was doing the research on this and I was like, I'm finding nothing. There's like <laughs> no interview. There's one interview I found from a blog from like a Greek blog. And it was like, they played a show in Greece and the guy was just like, Hey, ambushed them. Yeah. Can, can you do an interview? Can we do an interview? Please, please. And it was like, I get, they're like in the backyard of this guy's like house. I think, cause I think it was a house show even. And uh, there was just probably just be like, look, I'll give you food, yeah, that kind of thing. 
But I, even oh, like I tried to find so Decibel Magazine included this record on their like their Hall of Fame in 2011, mm-hmm. and so I was like, all right, there's got to be an article here, and so like I went, I found the article, and it was like. Well, we've begged the band for years to do an interview. We've had little drips and drabs of like conversation, like even like one of the biggest press magazines from heavy and loud music, like had a really hard time getting them to talk to them. And mm-hmm. they're like, so we met them at an Indian restaurant, and uh, like they did the interview at an Indian restaurant, and but unfortunately, the they're like, and to read the full article, purchase the magazine. I was like, sure. No. <laughs> Nobody scanned this and put it up in the last 10 years? I guess not. But mm. So I have not read that article, but now I'm like, mm, should I buy this back issue of Decibel just to read the interview? <laughs> I mean, it does seem pretty fascinating. Like, like I said, like, I think that that's a, it's like a, I mean, maybe, maybe there are bands that are able to do that this, this day and age, but certainly, uh, like, it seems, it, it, it seems like, you know, they're, they're, I mean, as kind of, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard for me not to think of them the same way I think of like Fugazi, where it's just like they're principled. They have the things that they do. They do not. They are not interested in any of the like. Okay, well, let's make a press kit. Let's make it this easy. There's like, no, we want to go. We want to play. It's like we're not here to sell shirts. We're here to play music. I think that's like really admirable, and you don't see too many bands do that uh, these days, where it's just like where they don't even where they're playing by a whole different set of rules than everyone else (laughs) yeah yeah because like they toured the world which was amazing too like Mm -hmm. they were playing literally all over the world and so clearly it didn't hurt their ability to play music live you know Mm -hmm. well it definitely makes i mean it definitely makes the case for like and i i understand the mentality that bands have of needing to do all of the press do all of the do interviews and create content and all of that stuff to try and like get yourself in front of other people Mm -hmm. um, and the work that you have to do. But it definitely, this approach really speaks to like the music can speak for itself. Like Mm -hmm. if you have a, a great record, you should be able to just tour on that great record. You should be able to send it to the venues and be like, Hey, this is our record. It sounds good. People have heard it. People know who we are. Book us. We'll Mm -hmm. play. People will come like, and I mean, you know, early two thousands versus today, like what was the what was the landscape like? I mean, how saturated were those markets and probably it was easier to do then, <laughs> but I don't think it's impossible to take some inspiration from this. Adapt definitely it not. for sure, but uh when no, I definitely agree. When was the first when did you first get into tragedy? So I I know for sure the first time I heard tragedy was actually on a G seven welcoming committee a podcast with the Chris Hanna from Pro- uh, Propagandi did, uh, and it had conflicting ideas from the second record, uh, Vengeance, on it. And so that was the first time I heard Tragedy, and I, I was just blown away. And uh, I don't know, I just I just hadn't heard like I've I've I'd heard D beat, I'd heard, uh, but uh, yeah, I even like you know I listened to Os Rotten and some of the more crusty hardcore type of bands, but uh definitely not with the same level of like melodic elements with octaves and uh so that was the first song i heard the first record i bought was nerve damage i think it was just like at the time i was just at at some record store and saw the tragedy records i'm like this one's the newest i'll get this one um and so yeah they're they're a band that like i got pretty into i've still never seen live but i think a lot of that is, you know, like I said, I was uh, like an Appalachian small town punk that needed to drive three hours to get anywhere. So there's so, uh, like most of my favorite bands I've, I've never gotten to see. Um, but, you know, definitely one of those like I've always said that like tragedy is one of the few bands that would bring me out of mosh retirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it does remind me, though, that I think tragedy played fest like a couple years ago and I'm like, huh. That was a bigger deal than I mm-hmm. than I didn't know at the time because it wasn't just them too. I think it was like tragedy and from Ashes Rise like playing. It was like a full crust day. Yeah. Like they had the Holy Mountain in there. And like you know they put like all the yeah. crust bands in together. I wonder if I could find man. You know fest lineups are hard to find like old 
like yeah. show lineups, you know. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I would love because I remember even I think at the time seeing that lineup that day, going, "Whoa, that's a lot of crust bands." <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, but like, I think one of the it, and so it, later tragedy. If you if if you, if you've never if you haven't done the deep dive, they definitely start getting. Uh, they get a little bit away from like the D beat with the last couple of records. I mean, it's still there, but like the first three records I think are like, you know, the pioneering emo crust. And then now they're just like a really heavy band that like, I mean, they they sound like tragedy, but they don't feel the need to like, it's not a song until you do the D beats. Um, And so I think that's uh, definitely pretty cool getting to see them. Like, I mean, I mean, for, for guys who have been like doing, that thing since like 96 or something like that i'm like hey this is cool they're like they're they're still like growing as a band and not just doing the same thing over and over which um i think is pretty interesting and cool <laughs> yeah because crust like crust and dbeat like they have these if you want to talk about genres with like rules <laughs> Like, yeah. those are the ones where it's just like, well, you got to sound like this, you know, to be mm-hmm. this type of band. Yeah, there was a period of time where, like, tragedy clones were all over the country. Like, yeah. it, it was like Midwest Emo or something where every band had someone who tapped and someone who would play, you know, yeah. uh, some sort of crust, crusty band um, that that was playing in Drop C, um, which, like, you know, I, I, like, yeah, that, that, that was definitely an era, but, like, I don't know. I mean, I have a lot of those records, and they all just sound great. Like even even a bad tragedy clone sounds really sick. <laughs> right. Like there's there's because the core of what makes that sound work is just good. So it's like yeah. <laughs> even if it's just derivative, you're like, well, she, it still rips. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very satisfying. Mm-hmm. It's maybe one note, but it's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on this album specifically, are there some like standout moments for you? Um, I mean, so I definitely get f- super fired up. Uh, like, I mean, the 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 album begins with like that long, drawn out uh, acoustic guitar intro where they're pretty syncopated and stuff. And then when it just like stops and with it's like uh, I shouldn't do I shouldn't do a tragedy voice, especially because. I peek the mic but like the <laughs> condition inside and out and it just like all kicks in it's so heavy um yeah that first song uh like intro into the first song is just like yeah i'm like bedroom moshing i'm every time i love that that song a lot um i like it and the last song it, 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 i also really really like uh chemical imbalance um like I feel like the, the the later songs on this record get a little bit more sludgy and and heavy, and they're not like so focused on like just playing D beats. Um, but like as kind of an aside, so this is something I was I was like I don't know if I should bring this up, but uh, the lyrics uh, for that last song, Chemical Imbalance, it, it, I don't know because I know that y- y'all grew up around the same time as me, and it's like it, there was definitely a. a this era of hardcore where it was like, oh, if you're on medication, you you're like out of your mind, mm. sort of thing. Like it's yeah. like very a- anti like medicine. You're just gonna be a glazed over zombie. You're gonna lose your personality. Um, yeah. And I guess maybe maybe that that stemmed more from like uh, over prescription of like opiates and Ritalin and stuff and kids. But like I know that whenever I was growing up. Um, this is the, the, like the one negative I'll kind of say about the record, but like it, it was, it's more of just like that entire era of hardcore music where the sentiment of like anti-medication was one that like made me whenever I probably needed like <laughs> anti uh medication, I was very resistant. I was like, I'm going to be like just drooling a total zombie. I'm going to lose all of it. And then like I resisted it for far too long. Um, and then when I finally got on like Zoloft, I was just like, "Wait, I could have been like just feeling normal like this whole time. <laughs> what is going on? I've been lied to by all the great punk bands of this day and age."
Yeah, that is a thing. Like, I definitely remember, too, being, like, even, like, in college, like, my first year of college, I was, like, this, I think I, you know, you had to write articles or, like, essays, and, like, I remember one subject I wrote was, like, the overprescription of uh, psychoanalytic drugs, and, like, I didn't know shit about shit. Like, I don't know anything. I didn't know anything about that kind of stuff. And I'm just being, like, 19 years old, being like, yeah, I don't want to. I was straight edge, too, so that probably, like, yeah, yeah. also threw that in there, being like, I'm scared of drugs and uh, mm-hmm. don't know what they do. <laughs> but, yeah, there was. It was, like, the stigma of, like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, you're just going to be zoned out, zombie drooling. Yeah, that was, like, a thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, co- converts it, dead or dedicated, alive or medicated. It's like, oh, I'm, you're gonna be if you want to feel alive, you can't have medication. Oh my right. god! <laughs> Which to me just implies that like none of them were on anything, <laughs> and that's why the, <laughs> I didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of. I think there was also the counter. There was a countercultural like just let people be freaks kind of mentality mm-hmm. and misconception about mental health mm-hmm. um it really goes really far back into punk and just being like no like these people aren't happy like it's <laughs> yeah. not that mm-hmm. oh these people are weird and they don't they just don't fit with society it's like you're talking about people who are having a lower quality of life like you can yeah you can be medicated and have a good mental health and like also be like you know, countercultural and not yeah. Yeah. and anti capitalist. Like you can you can do both of those things. Like right. Yeah, and I've, I what I discovered was like when I when I started getting that all sorted out, it's like, well, hey, I I'm more creative because I'm not like just trying to sleep thirteen hours a day yeah. because I don't want to like because I'm just depressed and have a di- difficult time getting out of bed. It's like, oh wait, I could. I could still play guitar and write cool riffs. Yeah. Perfect. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This idea that you have to suffer to make art, or it, it's, it is like kind of a thing that, mm-hmm. you're like, well, we have to have our artists suffer. Which to me feels like that must be something that came from not other artists, but like society at large or the government being like they can't be happy playing music for a living they should be <laughs> sad making music for a living <laughs> be troubled artists don't be happy because yes. i have to go to a regular job and i'm not happy <laughs> yeah it has to be yeah. a struggle it has to be a terrible lifestyle <laughs> because mm-hmm. if you give people hope that they don't have to work a shitty job <laughs> that they can go and be a creative person and everyone's gonna want to go do that. Then nobody's and gonna be a garbage man or a nobody. plumber. Or <laughs> and the and the thing is, it's like I've thought about this so many times in in recent years, where I'm like, if you paid me a living wage, I would do the dishes. Right? When people say <laughs> like, oh, who would do the dishes? I'm like, if you capped my hours at like 25, 30 hours a week, and you paid me enough money to pay my rent, I would do dishes. <laughs> every single day i'd be whistling I, the happiest person in the world like i would just do the most menial thing and then i can go home and i don't think about my job and be creative mm-hmm. on my in my spare time like would love to do that perfect <laughs> but uh so i will say the the other, like i mean i think that so this is uh something that maybe isn't interesting but like okay so my wife she's she listens to music and no matter what like live or anything she can always she latches onto the lyrics and the in the vocals immediately i've always struggled with that and maybe it might even stem from the fact that most of my most of the stuff i listen to is really abrasive and screaming but like <laughs> even when i even when i listen to something that has a very clear vocal line i've never been able to like i have to really work to hear and understand even the words um because i I hear basically vocalists. I'm just listening for like tonality and like the rhythm of it. Um, and so that's, that's just to say that I'm like, what, you know, even a song like like that chemical imbalance. Like I, I still think I'm like that's a that's a sick sick uh, <laughs> like uh, song. You know, it has that like da 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 da. Like, <laughs> like that's sick. Um, it's a, it's an interesting approach that like follows into uh, 
like Overo where like Lindsay and I share vocal duties and she's great at like melodies and like uh, come up with stuff. But I'm always just thinking of, I think of all my vocal parts come from percussives. I'm just trying to think of like what, what's an interesting like beat where she's like thinking about like melody and like what words will fit where. And I'm like, you know, just, I think in syllables. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've actually said on the show before where I'm like, I'm not a lyrics guy. And I mean that in the mm-hmm. sense of, like, I don't pay attention to what the song is saying. whenever, Even mm-hmm. if I can understand it, I, I just don't pay attention to what the words are actually saying. I, I'm like you, I'm mm-hmm. focused more on the, the tone, the, you know, the how they sing. Like, just, yeah, mm-hmm. just more as an instrument versus uh, mm-hmm. getting a, a message across. Now, I do like reading really good lyrics. Like, I go and read yeah. them, and I want them to be really good and smart, but... Mm-hmm. As far as like, as I sit and listen, I'm not like, wow, I love that line. And I'd be like, what's it? What does it say? I don't know. I didn't hear what, what did they say? <laughs> and uh, so this isn't a totally unrelated to tragedy, but it's just like, uh, like I said, I've taken like, I've, so I, like I got a PhD in creative writing. So like, I'm like, uh, I've read way too many books of like, of poetry and stuff that like, it, it's kind of different. It, it kind of ruined some song lyrics a lot for me. Like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll hear people be like, oh, yeah, like the genius of these lyrics. And I'm like, there isn't even concrete language. It just says, <laughs> just, just says like, and I'm feeling bad. Like, that's your chorus? Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all abstract. You need a good concrete image to make it, to because that's what makes good writing. <laughs> yeah. I have a friend who's always, he's always mess like, I'll tell him, like, hey, I like this album, you should check it out, and he'll listen to it and message me back, he's like, these lyrics are atrocious, I hate them so much, and I'm like, what? I don't even know what they said in that song, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I notice yeah, good lyrics, I don't care about bad lyrics, mm-hmm. like, it doesn't mean anything, it's fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what What did y'all think about, uh, cause I, I think it's like, uh, so the end of that first song when it's like and they won't have to burn the books because no one reads them anyway <laughs> yeah. like everything cuts it's like damn <laughs> tragedy yeah. going for it <laughs> I did like that line because like I, I actually read the lyrics to the album too and I was mm-hmm. like wow I do actually really like that idea of you won't the the concept that you won't have to burn the books because no one reads them anyway it's like yeah nobody reads <laughs> Nobody pays attention to anything anymore. That's why we're at, we're at the state we're at right now because mm-hmm. oh, nobody nobody reads. <laughs> no one learns from the mistakes of history. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's probably like hmm, I'm trying to think of like looking at the tracks. Uh, mm-hmm. Which ones are my favorites? The, the point of no return is just like a perfect way to start the record off. Like, yeah, you have to start it that way with an intro too, <laughs> leading into it. But yeah. I think probably my standouts are probably Confessions of a Suicide Advocate. So good. It has this like kind of doomy, sludgy intro to it. Huge drums, pick scrape, pick scrapes. Ah, there's so many pick scrapes on this record. I love. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like that's a that's a big standout track. Really, the first ha- before you get to the first intermezzo, I'm like, mm-hmm. this chunk is perfect. Yeah. And I, I love the uses of the intermezzos on here because there's there's mm-hmm. three of them, two back to back, which yeah was, tricked me whenever I was listening to it. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, it's just one intermezzo, and then I saw there were three. I was like, huh? How did I miss yeah. one? Oh, that's right. <laughs> They're just next to each other. <laughs> um, and then yeah, the back half of the record does a little bit more sludgy. Mm-hmm. It's a little slower, which is was fun to hear too in a crust record because like yeah, you think of crust as just like fast e beat. But like, not every single song on this record has that going on. Yeah, yeah, it's well, like I said, like I, I feel like it's like it's interesting because they were like a band that showed up and the, like they didn't feel uh, like they they'd done it before where they needed to be all fast all the time or like okay we need to songs need to be over before two minutes or something and they can some songs are longer some songs are shorter having all those like intermezzos. And I, and I don't know. I think this is a, a a record that I think is is really good when you just listen to it as an album rather than like as a track by track type of album where mm-hmm. it's like okay, well, what's the what are the because sta- even when you're like what are the standout tracks and I'm like I'm like usually I just put it on and I'm just like here like <laughs> like I'm I, all of it. I I, I like the, I like the flow of the record even when it's like um, you know 
the way that the the intermezzos or uh, these sort of like bridges um, interact with the songs and stuff so that it's not just an unrelenting record start to, to finish. It has room to breathe. Yeah, without the intermezzos, it would it would blur together to a point where you, you'd tune out or you'd stop paying attention to what was going mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. Like, it does a good job. It, it It's like almost as if the record is just like three big songs, I think is <laughs> how, how to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah the uh you know everything up to the first intermezzo is one big song and then there's what mm-hmm. one two three oh there's four tracks after the second intermezzo or and then you go into the yeah the final two tracks at the end of the record which the final two tracks are like a perfect way to end the album too because they have that mm-hmm. like like chemical imbalance despite its questionable lyrics at this you know yeah. in 2022 um yeah, yeah. <laughs> the it just feels like an ender like a really good closing to a record i mean yeah it, it, ending your record with hell hell is here hell yeah, yeah. <laughs> <So> yeah. Good. <laughs> I, I also I, I like that like you know i was talking about like uh you know certainly uh, so if i'm looking for like good writing i'm looking for different things but i love i love these lyrics for what they are where it's just like you know it's just like describe descriptions of war zones descriptions of like it's just so bleak uh you know i yeah the lyrics pulled up but it's just like you know we comprise the backbone of this leprous body of this lifeless form like (laughs) it's like full of just really bleak uh imagery with a lot of dead bodies and like it just looks like uh i don't know it's just like it's it's, it's like it was written by like I don't know a fucking Terminator or something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is what John Connor is like playing in in the in the future. That's his band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All bands of the future are crust punk crust bands yeah. and the yeah. Unless you're it's like all a, written by Skynet, yeah, yeah. That's where you're like your cyberpunk stuff comes in, yeah, like <laughs> digital grind or whatever you call that stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it. I kept reading that people were like, "These are apocalyptic lyrics," and then like going through them, I was like, "Yeah, it is kind of like that's <laughs> that's the only mode that it really." <laughs> it's great. I love it. <laughs> I am it's curious. It, oh, it's interesting up. how it immediately. Um, Speaking of apocalyptic, it's like mm-hmm. this is the first year of what Bush presidency or post Bush <laughs> election mm-hmm. pre nine eleven. This is like immediately before we launch into you know another unending war. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah I've never read other tragedy record lyrics. I wonder if they do get like more specific with their their takes. I like I said, I I don't. I remember them being more like this. Uh, there's like this uh, behind enemy lines, which is uh, like post Os Rotten tragedy clone, um, and they're incredible, but they're very much a like you know, and George Bush, you know, yeah. <laughs> like it, like they ha- like that's like uh, their their whole mo, um, which is interesting because I think they're still a band that sometimes plays shows, but they haven't r- written anything. Um, or at least recorded anything uh, post the Bush presidency, uh, <laughs> so it's like okay, uh, but yeah, it's it's it, it's very interesting because I don't know, it, like going back and like consuming media from like uh, you know early two thousands is very I find it real fascinating to like see like a um, like Battlestar Galactica for example, and it's like oh this is very much a war on terrorism allegory and mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. and like noticing that and how it how it hits in what it's speaking to in different ways I and mean, even just uh john stewart kind of coming back with that new apple uh tv show i'm like it feels very different to see like these uh like figures that i so associate with you know my coming of age during a really div- a, a very divisive time that's also very different like you know uh, than uh, like in some ways is probably it was probably better back then but it doesn't feel like it <laughs> yeah um yeah i know what you mean like there's the the 
energy is very different. Like if you go back and mm-hmm. look at that kind of stuff, like mm-hmm. I remember watching, oh, what are the 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 uh, the Catherine Bigelow movies like Hurt Locker, and then right after that she did Zero Dark Thirty, and I remember seeing them years after they'd been made, like after they'd come out. So I was just watching them later and just being like, man, this is weird. Weird to be in this, like, <laughs> this feeling where, like, most of America was okay with it. You know, what was going on? Mm-hmm. And it's just like, ah, God. I mean, all the punks I knew back then were like, fuck George Bush, but they weren't really, like, going into, like, the <laughs> the specifics yeah. and the details. I mean, like, no, this is what he's doing. Like, you know. Yeah. I think that the... I think it will always be relevant to talk about the bush presidency and the war on terror and and in it through it from a critical lens i think it, i think it'll always be valid to say like this is specifically what was so fucked up about that time period mm-hmm. and and criticizing it i think what has not aged well from a lot of the you know the rock against bush and like the john stewart daily show you know kind of coverage of of all of that is that there was I think and I think this is maybe what what is the difference between then and what is the difference between like political commentary now is that then there was still hope (laughs) maybe (laughs) there was there was a like we can we can just tear down this one this one guy yeah like Mm -hmm. we can just take down this one guy and we'll be back on track like Mm. Which has not aged well because, like, what did we then proceed to do for eight years? Nothing. Yeah. And yeah. then take another step back mm-hmm. with Trump. And then it, now it's just like, well, this is going to be the struggle for the rest of our lives. And <laughs> Yeah. And and tragedy has, it, it, oh, you know, 22 years ago had that hopelessness already ground into <laughs> us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, well, you know, pure anti-consumerist, pure like anti-war uh you know i mean confessions of a suicide advocate i mean the whole thing you uh what, what is it uh suicide is not an option it's illegal and punishable by death <laughs> it's like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> yeah there it is it, it is i guess i'd like to know like more about them as individuals like what are they doing in their free time like what is their like their reading like are they just like Oh yeah, I only read radical literature. Or are they Maybe. just like, no, nah, the world's fucked, <laughs> like that kind of. <laughs> I I, w- I want it both ways. I want them to yeah. both be uh, like as intense as I as as I want them to be, but then also, you know, I, I remember there being I I was never super into this band, but like uh, the basis for Perfect Future was really into weekend nachos. Mm-hmm. And he was saying that, like, he, he, I mean, he read, like, every interview, watched everything, and he was, like, saying, talking about how the guy from Weekend Nachos was, like, yeah, it's, like, all these bands pretend like they don't go to brunch. It's, like, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, you know the guys from Tragedy at some point, just, like, having a vegan barbecue or whatever. <laughs> maybe you're, maybe not vegan. I don't know. What, I don't know what their diet is. Like, <laughs> it's, like, they're, they're probably having, you know, you know, maybe maybe went to a soccer game or something. <laughs> yeah, they're they're bound to have like some of them at least are bound to have family and kids. So it's not yeah. like yeah, <laughs> they they didn't stay, you know, screen print shop owners their whole lives. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm still a server I, at a vegan restaurant. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, but maybe, maybe they, they are. Like, I mean, I, yeah, you know, <laughs> I want it both ways. I want them right. to have. I want them to be angry and pissed all the time, but also have moments of joy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess, too, like, the idea of them just, like, not ever really sharing a lot about themselves, it makes it even more likely to be, like, they could be just, like, super normal. Or then they could also be, like, you know, ma- super mainstream. I mean, I don't know. This type yeah. of lyric and lifestyle, they're not necessarily going to be mainstream. But, like, yeah, if you saw... Maybe- they might like Spider Man. Yeah, you know. Yeah, see that? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Like, I'm sure they've seen some of the Marvel movies, you know. <laughs> but then you also want them to be like, no, they only they still live in a squat and they uh, they dumpster dive yeah. for all their food and belongings. <laughs> yeah, both. <laughs> and they get to have that like kind of Schrodinger's cat sort of like existence where we're like, 
it's both. They they have yeah. both. <laughs> he, he drives a sensible car, but uh, all of his clothes were free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any final thoughts on the record? Um, I guess the only other thought. Is, I mean, I, I like I I've been listening to this record over and over and over again just because I was like it, to. First, because I said I took this very seriously. What, what's my favorite <laughs> album from 2000? What's the perfect one? Um, but I still think that probably uh, Vengeance, the second record, is the one that I like, is the one I'm more likely to reach for most of the time. Um, so, yeah, just incredible band all around. Yeah, I, I look, I usually try and look and see what, like, the general sort of, like, what's the more popular record? Mm-hmm. And everything I I saw showed that like the second record is probably the more popular one, the one that people go to the most. Yeah. Um, the first song on that one, conflicting ideas. If that's if there's one that people want, if they liked the uh, what what you got from this one, um, but wanted the same vibe but just slightly better, conflicting ideas. That's a that's my that's that's the song. <laughs> That's the one that will bring me out of Mosh Retirement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Um, well, thank you so much for doing the show. Uh, this is a lot of fun talking about this record. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll wrap up with your uh, where should people find the band, follow everybody, all that good stuff. Yeah, so uh, Overo's, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're pretty much on all the places uh we're a little bit more active on Instagram than on Facebook and stuff, and but like Bandcamp, you can find us uh, all everything there. Same with any of the streaming services. Uh, it only ends once is kind of the, the same. Less so on Instagram. I don't really promote that one as much because it's a different vibe. But it's all on Bandcamp and Spotify, Apple, uh, like any Apple Music, mm-hmm. wherever you, wherever you stream, you'll find. The stuff. Yeah. <laughs> all the usual stuff. I'll make yeah. sure to include all of that in the show notes as well. And uh, Yeah. Oh, you can buy all, all the records from the labels or directly from us, but uh, maybe the labels, they're better at mail order than we are because they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're going all the time yeah. to the, to the, yeah. the your, post office. Your copies are more to sell at the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anything to look out for show-wise? Yeah, we're actually playing our record release show for um, next uh, next Saturday, and then we're gonna we have a run of Texas shows coming up in uh, in in June as well. Um, starting to book a few things in August, and like uh, yeah, we're mostly we're mostly looking at stuff uh, or, or in or around Texas for the summer, and then tentative plans for maybe something happening uh next year um but yeah just just jobs and stuff where we are not in a we're not in a there's no intention right now to do the the big perfect future 60 day tour or something like that well that's perfect because uh this episode will go up uh literally the wednesday before the record release show so excellent If, if you're in the texas area I mean, Texas is gigantic, but, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and that, that show's going to be, there's no cover as well. So oh. if you're in Houston, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much again for doing the show. Thanks.